Oh, <clears throat> you're muted. <laughs> um, it's 402, so we'll get started. Um, does somebody want to make a motion to call the meeting to order? Anybody? Amy? I can call the meeting to order. <laughs> Amy. I make a motion to call the meeting to order. Sorry, I'm not I'm not fast on that mute button. <laughs> oh, um, I second the motion. So it's uh, 4.02, February 10th, um, 2021, East Hampton Board of Health. Let it be known that um, Jen Lesperance is absent. And our first business is public speak time. Well, I would like to do some public speak. Uh, my name is Michael Lavalle. I'm the owner of the Brass Cat in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Uh, been in business for over 25 years here in town. And uh, I'd like to just share a letter for the record that I emailed to uh, Maggie Hebert and Brie Eggstat in regards to, uh, well, the letter is self-explanatory, so I'll just read it. Uh, to the East Hampton Board of Health, I write to you this afternoon in regards to fair and equitable reopening permissions and guidelines in the city of East Hampton. I had a meeting at the Brass Cat in mid-November with health agent Brianna Eggstadt. I asked what it would take to use the indoor space over the winter to get through the pandemic and keep people employed. I was told that the only way to resume any indoor operation would be to build an on-premise commercial kitchen. It did not make sense to make that kind of large investment for a temporary situation. Shortly after, I became aware that Fort Hill Brewery was operating their indoor space with use of a food truck, permission granted by the Board of Health. I can see no difference in the use of each of the respective indoor spaces. Both rooms are solely for adults to gather and drink under the auspices of state and locally granted liquor licenses. In June of 2020, Maggie Heber emailed me that the Board of Health would allow use of a food truck in lieu of a retail food license for outdoor space. Fort Hillbury was also granted the same permission for outdoor space. As cold weather prevented use of outdoor space, Fort Hill was allowed continued use of a food truck for use of their indoor space, while the Brass Cat was to close without use of indoor space for the winter. The state reopening guidelines intent was to give businesses not normally serving food the opportunity to be open through ways to meet the local permitting process. I am fully aware of the vagaries and confusion around implementation of the governor's orders. I understand that all factors of businesses reopening in Massachusetts are evolving rapidly. However, I am confused as to why the board deemed food trucks acceptable for both outdoor spaces, but for only one indoor space, Fort Hill. Seeking clarification, I recently spoke to Jose Gonzalez from the Massachusetts Division of Labor Relations, which has been assisting boards of health throughout the state in policy clarification matters. He said that if a food truck meets the local board of health standard for a retail license for one business during phase three of reopening, another business should not be excluded. The fact that one business has a brewer's license and one does not is irrelevant to the intent of the state guidelines. I would like to impress upon the board, there is a large financial difference between constructing, licensing, training and staffing a commercial kitchen in an attempt to remain in business and making arrangements with a local licensed food truck enterprise to accomplish the same. I would like the same opportunities granted to similar businesses. I would also like the board to be aware that the beer garden and parking lot area of the Brass Cat is a permanent part of the liquor license and business footprint. No special permitting is required. A food truck, I believe, would be an on-premise kitchen. I hope we can all agree that a fair interpretation and implementation of Massachusetts reopening guidelines is good for all businesses in East Stanford. I ask the board to address this matter in the future. Thank you for your time. That's what I have to say. I'm done with my public speaking. Okay, thanks, Michael. Thanks, and, um, thanks Mike. Um, you know that uh, if you wanna come before us at the next meeting, 
um, just give us notice and we'll place you on the agenda. Yes, I would like to be at the next meeting and I would certainly like the next meeting to be soon because you know time is of the essence for this business and everything in my life. Understood. Okay. <clears throat> Does anybody else have any public speak? Questions, concerns? Okay, um, I think we can move on to the next part of our agenda, which unfortunately I don't have in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, introduce the new Healthy Youth Coalition Coordinator, Rebecca. Here we are. So you'll just have to unmute. Hello everyone. Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> nice to meet all of you. Thanks for inviting me um, to introduce myself. So I am Rebecca Edwards. I am now coordinating the East Hampton Healthy Youth Coalition. And um, I'm happy to, I don't, I'm not really sure kind of where people are in terms of knowledge about the coalition and what we do. So um, I don't know, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm also happy to like talk to any of you about ways that we could collaborate. And I'm also happy to learn from you if there are lots of things that you know that you want to teach me. So just so Rebecca knows, because sometimes I don't know um, if I explain it well, but Amy, Maggie, and Jen are on the board. So they're appointed by the mayor and they have terms. I don't know when everyone's term is up, hopefully never. Um, and they oversee the health department, I guess. Um, so we did, we've had, so the, just, and for the board's knowledge, the East Hampton Healthy Youth Coalition was under the schools for the longest time. And I think you guys know that, but it recently within the year, I think about a year ago, it was transferred into the health department, which has, was kind of rocky at first the transition, but with things seem to be working out well now. We did have a coordinator, Lori, who left and Rebecca took over in what month? Mm. October, November? Yeah, mid-October. And we are making like a ton of strides forward. Um, Rebecca, I don't know if you wanna to touch on some things, but we're doing the website and she's redoing the website and we just actually hired another person. So I don't know if you wanna to touch on that. Yeah, so we've spent the last few months really um, trying to solidify who we are as a coalition. And so we solidified our mission, we redid our vision, um, we are choosing a new logo and redoing our website with Cider House Media. Um, and we just had a retreat in order to look at our action plan. We're in the year, the year seven of our 10 year drug free communities grant. So we are thinking about what do we want to accomplish this year uh, in terms of what our highest priorities are, what our highest impact will be, but also what our limitations are with COVID um, and how we can use the strengths of remote programming. Um, and then also thinking about an eye of sustainability into the future and when the drug free community grant ends. So we've been doing a lot of um, shoring up our kind of our internal process of who we are and we're getting ready to do a whole bunch of promotion into the community. Um, we're gonna be building out a youth advisory committee, a parent advisory committee. And like Bree mentioned, we are just hiring an outreach worker, a parent and youth outreach worker to really be out there in the community, bringing people in and um, rallying people to the coalition. That sounds great, Rebecca. It's, it's exciting. It's really coming together. Good. Does um, anyone else have any questions? On yeah, the board? yeah, Jen, Amy, any questions? Well, thanks for coming, Rebecca. I just wanted you to be able to put a face to our board of health. And yeah, thanks. And um, if you do have any questions or can think of any connections, people that I should meet, um, please feel free to reach out. I can put, I don't know if my, I can put my email in the chat if that would be helpful. Sure. If there is a chat. 
Um, I don't think there is a chat. I was looking for that too. It might be disabled for this Zoom. Right. Well, um, you can certainly get my email from Bree, but it is R Edwards, E D W A R D S, at easthamptonma.gov. Thank you. Thanks. You can stick around if you want, but don't feel obligated. <laughs> Okay, and next on the agenda. Three, is it Amy? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, introduce uh, our new public health nurse, Amy, which um, is first time that we've ever had a full-time public health nurse, which is, it's sad, but a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we had to have a pandemic to um, prove that we needed one, but it has been night and day having somebody in-house to do our contact tracing because when we were contracting with the city of Northampton, they did an amazing job, but they were really just doing contact tracing when it came to the businesses and technical questions and all that kind of stuff. We, we didn't really have them um, for that. So Amy has, it's, it's just, it's been very helpful, but Amy, I don't know if you want to, um, you'll just have to unmute, kind of give a background and what you've been up to. Hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you all. Um, I think I've been in the role full time just over a month now, month and a week, I guess. And uh, yeah, right into the middle of the surge, actually, after the holidays. So <clears throat> I just just doing a little bit of I had a brief breather today. Things have slowed down a little bit, thankfully. And I was able to kind of look at see what's been going on so far. And I noticed we've had over 350 COVID cases in East Hampton since the beginning of this year. So that's a lot of people <laughs> who've gotten it. Uh, th fortunately, the vast majority have had very few symptoms, if any at all. Um, so, you know, that's both a great thing as I talk with people, most people are doing okay. And it's also really scary how many people are probably out there having no idea that they're carrying it. I just read an article the other day. I think people are estimating maybe up to 10 times the number across the country of people have actually been infected than we actually have reported and confirmed. So there's a lot out there. Uh, I'm really glad to be in this role. I'm glad that um, there's resources to support someone full time. There's a ton of work to do. Uh, and I'm really hoping we can move forward. I was just talking with Bree, uh, doing more outreach and education, um, you know, trying to slow the spread the way there were so many resources and efforts going on in the spring, really not resting on our laurels with the vaccine because it is gonna be a while and we also still don't know what's gonna happen with the new variants. So I'm focused a lot on that. My background is in mental health um, and psychiatric nursing. So I'm also thinking a lot about the mental health impacts addiction, um, children, youth being at home, um, you know, what it'll be like for all of us <laughs> going forward since we've had su such little social interaction. Um, so anyway, I'm here as a resource. Uh, I have a background actually in health communications as well. Um, so I'm always thinking about how to best reach out to people. I'm here to support whatever you wanna be doing too. Thank you. Um, I'm excited have, about your okay. mental health background, Amy, because um, that's going to be a big thing like now and going forward for our community. So um, whatever you can think of to help the city of East Hampton along those lines would be much appreciated. Amy, do you, so I know uh, when we first, I'm the uh, health director for the town of East Long Meadow. So I, I also do the some of the Maven work. So I'm curious, I know we don't get it right away if it's um, any of our cases or the new strain, but after DPH runs it, they do reach out to the residents again to let them know it is part of the new strain. Do you happen to know if, if we have any of those new strains circulating within East Long Meadow, uh, East Hampton? Great question. I have not heard of any yet. I also was not under the impression that they were already running all the samples through that additional layer so it's maybe not you all know of more them. than I do they're not they're not running all of them it's a it's a percentage yeah yeah not the, so no one's alerted me yet um and actually I'm waiting 
uh, to hear that there was, a, well, I won't go into it, but <clears throat> there was something happening with the Broad Institute that's running the majority of the samples. They might be pulling back some of the confirmed cases from a couple of weeks ago. So we will be hearing about that and, and working with the residents if they were affected. But yeah, so far, no, no clue yet. <laughs> yeah. So if there are any residents watching, I think it's, you know, we do know that at least three of the four strains are in Massachusetts. So um, making sure that uh, masking uh, is even more important at, the, at this time. Um, I know it's, it's been a long road with the masks, but if we could put a little plug in now that we, we know those strains are here and those masks are what's gonna uh, help keep us um, safe through all of the additional strains that come. So keep those masks on. <laughs> great, great. Even if you've been vaccinated, <laughs> still have to take all the precautions that have been in place up to now. So, yep. Yeah, yeah it's also been um, really helpful having Amy, we meet with the schools, uh, I think it's weekly at this point, about reopening and um, it's just good to have the medical professional at these meetings because you know I'm kind of involved in everything but not and but Amy's like an expert in exactly what we're seeing with the cases and all that so it's just it just it's very good and nice to have somebody that's dedicated to East Hampton I think um, so I'm just grateful that we have somebody now so Yes. Yeah, and Amy, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but maybe for the next meeting, we could get a little demo background, like of what de our demographics look like and what they have looked like through the course of the pandemic. So uh, I know like at the beginning of the pandemic in the spring, we saw a lot of the cases clustered in long-term care facilities and other congregate living. But after the summer and through the fall and winter, we've seen those cases move out of those types of facilities and back into the community-based transmission. So it might be good for our residents. I don't know how many people watch our meetings. Hopefully you're all watching our meetings, but um, if we could get that information to our residents. So they, they have some concepts of how this um, pandemic has emerged in their own community and what the age breakdown might look like. So I know, you know, back in the spring, it was mostly uh, our older population who was uh, struggling with this uh, pandemic. And now as we move forward, we're seeing that kind of middle age demographic being the highest numbers of our caseloads. So just maybe breaking that down. And I can give you some demographics that might be great for our residents to hear for the next meeting. But I think some kind of kind of rundown from you now that we do have someone in this position and we do have someone with uh, more experience. And now that Bree isn't carrying every single thing on her own, it would be great to get a little dive a little deeper into that for people. Yeah, actually I did, um, like I said, I had a breather today. I was able to look at a few different things. I was able to break down. I was just focused on from um, the beginning of this year till now. So those 350 cases, I'll definitely go back and see what was going on at the end of the summer and the fall. Uh, but an interesting couple of things I noted, um, one was that the breakdown by gender is 52% uh, female to 48% male. So not terribly surprising, but I thought that was interesting. Um, Hispanic cases, 11% in East Hampton, which I think is a much higher representation than we have in the population. So that was of note. And then as far as age ranges, the highest group, um, uh, other, so the, the very, very highest group is from 19 to 29. So these are the folks who are doing a lot more of the socializing. Um, and then the next group after them, I think is their parents. This is the 50 to 59, um, followed really closely by the 40 to 49. I'm seeing far few cases of people in their 30s, of people um, 60 and over. Uh, so it really is the active workers, um, the people who are having, you know, household transmission is probably the biggest thing I'm hearing about, a lot less with congregate um, situations. Mm -hmm. uh, and also everyone's yeah. practices have greatly improved. So even when you have someone who's positive uh, in this closed setting, everyone's just, you know, knows exactly what to do. And I'm hearing a lot less about like staff to resident transmission, resident to resident, that kind of thing. Yeah. But tons of one person in the family gets infected through a coworker or off, more often than not a friend or an extended family member. And then it races through that household. Um, and we, it seems like we have a fair number of multi-generational households in East Hampton, or at least people who live really close to each other and consider themselves a unit. Um, so that's where the older cases are definitely coming from. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. So maybe also uh, the clusters, like what are the three primary cluster types that are in 
uh, East Hampton. So it, it sounds like household transmissions are the number one cluster, which I think is con pretty consistent across the state. But then also like, are we having uh, sports clusters? Are we having uh, outbreaks at employment places? Uh, I think that, I think we, we're hitting now almost a year onto this pandemic. And uh, sometimes it's really hard to continue to keep our guard up. And if we know kind of where these things are happening and a reminder of kind of, um, that, that it is still happening. It, it will help our residents have that little extra uh, effort or help them to understand why that little extra effort and that inconvenience of still wearing a mask and doing those and not seeing um, gathering in large groups is so important. So that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. My main message is stronger masks and get tested as often as you can. <laughs> so thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks Amy, good to have you on board. And Amy is um, going to be at our forum tomorrow as well. I put her as one of the speakers because I think um, she'll be able to offer up some of this information and then also bring up the fact that there's been a lot of cases with minor symptoms and, and such. So and we'll talk about the forum after too. Great. Bye guys. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. So the next part is the FY22 budget. Um, I can't switch back and forth on my screen because my I remote in and if I remote I can't use zoom on my remote desktop because it thinks I'm at the office and I don't have a speaker at the office so it gets confused so I'm going to try to recite it based off of memory <laughs> um, or at least there's nothing really crazy differences to it we just have you know me full-time Amy full-time Amy's going to be full-time funded from now until December 30th with CARES and FEMA. And then from December 31 to July 1 will be regular general fund because as of now, CARES and FEMA ends December 30th. Um, then Rebecca Edwards and her new assistant and Jackie who worked for East Hampton Healthy Youth too, they're all grant funded, but they are listed on our budget. And the health inspector position, which is 20 hours a week. We also have a COVID compliance inspector that we can use under CARES and FEMA. I haven't posted the position yet because um, I wanted to confirm I had enough money with some with adding Amy and such. I wanted to make sure we still had enough. But I'm thinking, I don't want to say there's not as much of a need, but we're not getting as slammed with COVID complaints as we used to. We definitely still get our fair share, but I'm thinking of saying that's like an up to 15 hour a week position. And when we hire a new health inspector, I will offer it to them too, if you wanna work up to an extra 15 hours a week. If they don't, then I'm thinking we should be looking for somebody that can work five hours a week or 15 hours a week, or kind of just work kind of like our animal inspector, like when we have an, an issue, he comes in. So. Those are our main positions and then Jackie's position. Um, we did have to cut the operating budget by two and a half percent, which for me was $98. <laughs> so it was not that difficult. Um, so I think I just decreased our professional services line, which is what we used to use um, Chris Majewski for um, before we had an inspector, but I still want to keep that just for weekends, um, emergencies, that kind of stuff. And then also it, we can also use that line for if we ever have to board and secure a house after an issue or any cost that could come into play with cleaning up a condemned house or something. So I don't want to get rid of that line, but the budget's pretty straightforward. Um, I did send it to you guys, the narrative, yep. a lot of COVID stuff in there. Um, but when we, with the addition of the health inspector position, we were able, we hired Alex in August and from August to about December, he was able to get a good chunk of our routine inspections done. So um, trending in the right direction, having that position obviously helps a lot. Alex did resign. So um, we are, that position is posted. So we are looking, we have gotten, not a lot of applicants. So we are posting to Indeed today, which will generate a lot of applications and they're not always experienced, but I mean, it's better than one. So I have actually hired off of Indeed before at my last job and we hired a really great inspector and she's still there and she's awesome. So um, 
Uh, can I interrupt you for one second? How many hours a week is that position? It's 20, so it is benefited, which I think is kind of a good deal. So is there right. any is there any hopes of getting that uh, more hours or, or is that where we're kind of going to be sitting at? So with the COVID compliance position being 15 hours, that it makes that person full time up until December 30th if they want it. So there is the, the option. I didn't put in for it full time because I'm assuming it would get denied because we, we've got the, the FEMA and CARES money until December 30th. So I don't think it would go full time until next fiscal year starting July. I'd have to propose it once we no longer have CARES and FEMA money available. Great, thanks. And then when are you thinking of posting the, um, or have you posted the regular health inspector the regular health inspector has been posted for, I want to say, three weeks now. It's just hard because, I mean, as Amy knows, this, the position is such a specific job that it's not like just anyone has the qualifications. However, we will train somebody if they have the personality and the work ethic and the organization. Um, so that's why I kind of want to put it onto Indeed because we could get somebody that's we got somebody when I used to work in Sturbridge that works, she managed a large scale kitchen. So she had all like she and she taught serve safe. So she had all the food background. So like, I just don't want people to see the posting and get scared because I know when I did when I was 21 years old, <laughs> there's so many licenses and I remember seeing stuff about burial permits and beavers and all this stuff. And I'm like, I have no idea any of this, but it's trainable. So I I want to put it on Indeed and get more applicants. And I've I've sent it to some of my colleagues in the area and try to get the word out. But I think there's just a lack of qualified people and health departments for the first time, like in history, have been funded with this extra CARES and FEMA. So I think a lot of people have already been scooped up. I mean, Northampton just hired, I think, 10 people. So they're getting everyone. <laughs> Also, it's a hard sell to get someone to come to work at the health department right now. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. But aren't the 10 people at Northampton just for the um, vaccine Clinic. college? Yeah, they're like public health ambassador. So it's it's kind of like entry level, but I would take an entry level person if, if yeah. they were the right yeah. person. Well, um, maybe so. word out to Meredith. Like. I know she has one person that I was going to, I'm going to contact because they said he's just awesome and um, okay. see if he wants to supplement. So it, it, 20 hours a week benefited and it has the possibility of being 35 up until at least December. But I think by now people understand the need in, in health departments. It was hard to sell it a couple of years ago, but I think, not that it was hard to sell it, but I think people didn't really understand it, but now I think people are getting it. So hopefully moving forward, we'll have better, you know, support. But is there anything in the budget that you guys saw that you want me to add or edit or change? I did, I do need to edit it just because I forgot to split Amy Hart's position in half. Um, half cares fee until December and then half general fund. So I do, I do have to do that. But other than that, is there anything, we have a budget meeting tomorrow, me and the mayor and finance director. And that's kind of when they give us like a idea of what they're thinking. So if there's anything you want me to change, let me know. I just had one question, the medical supplies, you know, PPE, um, it's only 200 dollars mm -hmm. you guys have to wear that if you do a home inspection when you go into the restaurants i'm just wondering if that's enough so i've been able to use cares and fema for a lot of that kind of stuff um but you bring up a good point because cares and fema isn't going to be around forever um we do have a pretty good supply of like masks hand sanitizer and that kind of stuff right now um but if the other thing too, just the operating budget, whatever it equals out to, if I go negative in medical supplies, as, as long as I'm, I have a surplus in mileage or something else, clothing or sheriff's fees, whatever, it's okay. I just can't go negative in every single category. <laughs> it's a big problem. But um, yeah, if you, if, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that, Amy, with, cause you guys have CARES FEMA and stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, 
most of our PPE comes out of the Emergency Preparedness Coalition. Okay. So I don't I don't know if Ham what Hampshire County does for that. I know you guys have a very robust program, so I'm sure that they're bulk ordering supplies, which then get distributed amongst the communities. Also, if we do need to to buy that stuff, a lot of times if we can link up with some other communities, that uh, it will become cheaper. Like you buy in quantities, and it becomes cheaper. So hmm. I think Bree's right. It's keeping it at that level, and then if we need to kind of borrow from other um, levels, other, or other line items, it makes yeah. more sense. Okay. I'm satisfied. Okay. <laughs> um, the next part of the agenda, if we're ready to move on, is just the health director position update. Um, so they finally went to city council. They needed to add the actual title to our pay plan. That has to go through city council and it did, but then they had to post it internally and I had to apply for it. And I think the time frame is up. I don't think anyone else applied. Like Amy said, I don't know who would want to apply. <laughs> At this point, they can have it. Um, but I think that's a go. So I'll be in the correct grade. So I just wanna say thank you guys for the support on that. And it's been a long time coming, but at least it's it's here. So um, I'm just sorry it took so long, Brie. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I know someone else mentioned. Oh, I, I wonder if I could change my title. I said, yeah, be prepared for like a two year. Pro it's not it was not easy. So um, but no, I, again, I think it's one of those things the pandemic kind of had to shine a light on this yeah. position in general. So also, I think the mayor is really attuned as to what's going on across the state and the legislations that our governor is passing, I think she's really uh, involved in that stuff. And I think she sees that local public health across the state is changing. And if we want to be uh, competitive for grants and other benefits of uh, quality delivery of local public health services, we're gonna need the infrastructure, the staffing, and the quality people in those positions in order to compete. And so by doing that, she set the town up at a great position to be able to compete at that level. So yeah. not Brie, it's been, it's of course well-deserved and I think we've done a lot of advocation, but I, I think uh, that's where the state is going. And uh, we, we kind of got on the, we're, we're, we're on our way. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's great for the, it's great for you, but it's also great for the community. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. And you know that you're locked into not leaving like for at least the next 20 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like it when it's put this way is if, if we were to win $20 million in the lottery tomorrow and she were to leave, it does also make the position much more appealing to anybody uh, of quality who we'd like to replace her because yes. at an agent or at the, the level it was, the quality of candidates that East Hampton is going to attract isn't going to be the same as if it is a director and it is getting fairly compensated. So uh it really has started to create a health department in east hampton that we have desperately needed our our whole town is growing and developing and a, a strong health department is in the best interest of all our residents our schools our businesses and so many things for our community and um if we were to win those 20 million dollars i hope she would share first of all but second of all uh we would have a position that would be competitive for the for uh, the very limited workforce that currently exists for local public health. Mm -hmm. Well said, Amy. Yes, thank you, Amy. So the next part on our agenda is just items not reasonably anticipated by the chair, 48 hours in advance of the meeting. The only thing I just wanna add is um, oh, the cat. Um, we have our forum tomorrow. It's um, Northampton did one, Amherst did one, and we're gonna do one tomorrow. I went to the Northampton one and so did Jackie. And it, there's presenters from CDH, two doctors, um, and they go over just kind of general information about the vaccine, FAQs, you know, kind of debunk some of the rumors out there. And it was extremely helpful. And then Amy's gonna come on Amy Hart and she's gonna speak about, you know, kind of what she's seeing, contact tracing and as the public health nurse. And then I have like a, 15 slide PowerPoint to go over clinics, how to sign up, where they are, who to call for help. Um, our clinic, our regional clinic is in Northampton or Amherst, but Northampton is the closer one. So it kind of just goes over what to expect and um, 
also to give a shout out to Jackie, Jackie is doing um, all of the signups for people that don't have access to the internet or email. And um, we've been able to keep up so far and it's been awesome and very well received. People are very happy. So Jackie is um, the driving force behind that. So that's been awesome. Um, I just want to point out the new or, or vaccine thing this week about um, anyone accompanying anyone can get a vaccine or how are we going to answer that? Because Meredith has not, I don't think she's going to do that. So are we just going to say that um, it's offered at the state sites for now? So as far as I know, and Amy, you might know too, the mass, it definitely at the mass sites like Eastfield Mall, Fenway and Gillette, but I talked with Meredith, Amy, I don't know what your thoughts are on, but she is concerned about the amount of vaccine they get. They might not have enough to, the focus is 75 plus. So if we allow for the caretakers or the um, husband, wife, whoever, that we might not have enough to get to where we're supposed to actually be getting. But Amy, are you gonna uh, allow that for your clinic? So right now the vaccine availability is really a problem. The the mass vaccination sites and the pharmacies seem to be getting a lion's share of the vaccine. So until they up the local distribution of vaccine, there's no way we can, I mean, we already have clinics a month in advance scheduled yep. and each in anticipation of what we may get designated by the state. And we can't add then a hundred caregivers to that because it's booked with what we anticipate our maximum distribution to be. So we are suggesting that anyone who is uh, wants to have a caregiver vaccinated with them, that they elect to go to one of the mass vaccination sites or one of the pharma pharmacy sites. Okay, good. Yeah, that's helpful. Hopefully with the addition of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we're gonna see kind of um, a change in the distribution processes, but all the way down from the federal government to hopefully us. But right now there's, there's there is really some chaos that's happening. And unfortunately we are the lowest on the totem pole when it comes to, even though we could probably run a bit more efficient, better directed and um, streamlined clinics than some of these larger organizations are doing. For some reason, it's, it's just been kind of put in the wayside and it's disappointing, especially for, you know, we're here to serve the residents of East Hampton, right? And I mean, we commute, we, collaborate with Northampton, but like we should be able to provide that service for our residents. We train on that, three trains on that. We have an emergency health coalition that annually provides plans to the state about how we're gonna max vaccinate our residents. Annually, we provide these plans. Pharmacies don't, like there's not other places that drill this. We have actual drills where we have to turn our school into a mass vaccination site. So East Hampton is in a fantastic position to be able to provide this to our residents. But without the actual vaccine, we're, it's, it's really disappointing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Canada can't even get any vaccine because it's going to the U.S. and Great Britain. It's, I mean, we're lucky that we have what we have because a lot of countries, I think, are having difficulty getting it. Not that that helps, but just kind of puts it in perspective a little bit, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the forums tomorrow night, it's going to be live streamed on channel 193. And we actually, our new IT director is fluent in Spanish. So she's going to be there to translate. So it's going to be awesome. Um, and like I said, the, the forum that Northampton put on was really great. So I think our residents will um, enjoy this and really benefit from it because I, I learned a lot from it and I listened to this stuff all day. So. Good. Um, do we want to set a meeting date? I know Mike Lavalley next yeah. wants to meet. We have to work out some stuff on our end. Um, so I don't want to commit too soon, but I obviously understand his concern about getting an answer. So um, next week is Monday's a holiday, which means Tuesday will be a mess. Well, I think we need at least a couple of weeks to prepare. Okay. Yeah. Cause we've got to, yeah, we've got to work some stuff out. So today's the 10th. Would you want to do like the first week of March? Sure. That would work. That would give us three weeks. 
Do Wednesdays work okay for you guys? Yeah. So Wednesday the third. Did you say yes, Amy? Uh, Wednesday the third would be really hard for me to do, but I could try to make it happen. Is it just going to be like a short meeting? Like what's? Well, unless other stuff comes up, but. Does yeah. the fourth work for people? The fourth would be a, a significantly better day. Yeah, yeah. Well, fourth or second, does second. I could do either one of those. At what time are we talking? I like 4 p.m. That's okay. Um, it's not, it's fine. It's just, it's. Let me just look at my work schedule. Okay, yeah, either one of those work for me. So what's easier, the second or the fourth, Amy? Let's do, let's do the fourth. Okay. And Jen, you're good? I'm good. So the fourth at 4 p.m. I can email Mike and just let him know. Yep. Three, four, at 4 p.m. All right, thank you. Is there anything in particular you would advise us looking at in preparation for that meeting? So I don't know, Amy, if I'm if we're even allowed to discuss what was discussed at public speak. I don't. I, I heard. I heard it. Um, There's a lot to it. <laughs> we're working uh, the kinks. We'll have an answer. Really, what it. it comes down to is that we just need guidance from DLS and the state. The I don't think Bree or any of us have any. Uh, strong feelings one way or the other. We're just trying to follow the recommendations and the guidelines that have been put on us to enforce. We didn't create these guidelines. We didn't ask for these guidelines. Right. But we were told in March and then in subsequent directives from the governor, you have to enforce these things. And uh, unfortunately right. it's put us in a really bad situation because even though logically, you know, what might be said by Mike or anybody else in the community makes sense and we would agree with them, we don't create these guidelines. We, right. we just are told to enforce them. So one of the things that I think uh, Bree and, and I have chatted about is we really just need some clear guidance from the state to be okay. able to tell these businesses. Clear and consistent. Yeah, because yeah, we're stuck in the middle. We really are. I mean, what's the issue? You know, I mean, is, is it vague in the language about? It's, it's just that um, there's a little bit of siloed um, Opinions at the state level. Okay. Um, of what consists yeah. of food trucks and square feet and all of that kind of stuff? Um, no, it's more well, of a It bar. comes down to what I think Mike was saying is if you're a brewery, you fall under one section. And if you're a oh, bar, okay. you fall under another. Okay. What's the difference? He spoke to one branch of the Division of Labor, Divi Division of Labor Standards, who's for equity amongst businesses. But when you talk to the Division of Labor Standards, whose job is to also enforce these governor's orders they're both getting they both are coming with different um overarching orders that they're enforcing so both of them are in fact right but it's getting yeah. them to agree about what we're supposed to do that we're kind of stuck at so and okay. i think at the state level people um you know one hand doesn't always know what the other one's doing so right. you know it's just trying to figure out uh, how that plays out for our businesses because I think all of us at this table and the mayor and the city council all want our businesses to, we want to be as flexible and as consistent as we can with all businesses in town. And uh, the only way we can do that is by unilaterally equally enforcing what we're asked to enforce. So as soon as we can get guidelines around that, I, I mean, I, Bri, I don't want to speak to you, for you, but I know where you stand and, you know, it's just, we're, we're happy to support all businesses in this process. Right. Thanks for clarifying that for me. Yeah. So, go ahead. I was just gonna say we've gotten in the past literal 20, 48 hours, I've gotten eight different answers. So until I get an answer in writing from somebody that's willing to put it in writing, I just, again, I agree with what Mike is saying the, and what Amy is saying, breweries and bars are pretty much the same thing, but they have from the start separated breweries and bars. And I think the intention was because breweries are typically outside and beer gardens and wineries. But then when it got cold, they never really readdressed the fact that now they're back inside. So of course, Mike is gonna be concerned. I would be too. Fort Hill and Mike 
are pretty much the same thing, but so why can't he open? And, and again, we don't feel, we're just trying to be by the book and be consistent because decisions that we make in East Hampton then will affect the entire region because they're going to see what we're doing and the state is not giving us a clear answer. So we, it's the last 24 hours have been crazy with, with the state. So we're just waiting for a clear answer and we'll get it to my ASAP. Yeah, so the reason for having some time is because Bree will need to draft up specific guidelines for East Hampton because once he opens, <laughs> everyone else, you know, will too. And that's great for East Hampton, but we just want to make sure that it's thoughtful and safe and fits both sides of the, you know, coin kind of thing. Makes sense. Yeah, and like Amy said, we did not ask for these regulations. <laughs> we do not. We did not ask to be the enforcers, unfortunately, but at the local level, it obviously gets put on us. So um, we also answer to someone in essence, we answer to the state and we need their help on this, so. Yeah, so. that's it, yeah. Any other? Issues that anyone can think of that should be put on the next meeting or tagged on to this one? No, I would I would like to get Amy some like demographics that it would be interesting to hear. I mean, I see we're recording this. I don't know if it's going to go like maybe on our Facebook page or something and where other people can see it. And because I think our I think it's interesting when people hear kind of what the demographics are in the community they live in versus these like ambiguous, ambiguous facts that they hear on the state or uh, national level so well, now I know that we have someone the mayor wanted to do like a dashboard my I and I think that we do on the website her office does it um I was hesitant at the time because of capacity I just don't have the time to do a daily dashboard every day with demographics but um and Amy also was super swamped when she first started because it was right after the holidays but um would you guys want would it be helpful for you guys? Maybe every board of health meeting, she just kind of like how I used to give you my numbers, give you guys like a quick oh, yeah. of what happened in the month. I can yeah. ask. I, I think a monthly dashboard is totally manageable where we kind of update yeah. what's, you know, at the, at the board of health meeting or, you know, the first of every month, we kind of close up the numbers for yeah. the previous month and just get a picture. You know, where, who's being affected right now? What, where are the clusters happening? You know, we know hockey is a problem. Basketball is an emerging trend. And how does that help our parents and our community make decisions for their children? And, you know, just things like that, I think are real time metrics that uh, will make a difference for our community. And I think Amy will like that. Amy has a really diverse background um, with exactly that communication. So maybe every month she can draw up the numbers and do like pie charts and graphs and make like a little dashboard that we can post on the first of every month. So I think that's an awesome idea. I'm glad that you brought that up. And I don't know if we have like, uh, I don't know as much in East Long Meadow, we have community active television where once a month I kind of go on and I give him mm -hmm. the, the rundown and he puts that on all the, he runs it like on a loop on the community active television so people can see it who don't always have Facebook or access to other things. So what, whatever update she gives us, if she could also do a Zoom with the community uh, access people and they could put that on a loop for some of our older population who might not be looking at Zooms or you That's know meeting notes. Yeah, Amy. Yeah, that is awesome. I think she would enjoy that too because Amy has much more skill than just contact tracing. You know, she, she's, she, we're kind of not using her you know, to the best of her ability by her just contact tracing, which at first, you know, that was her, she had to because we had so many clusters and crap going on. But now that things are slowing, I think that's a good segue into kind of increasing her role. So I think that's good. Yeah. Also, one other piece is once uh, we have that, if she has that kind of like one pager for us monthly, is to also send that to the mayor for the top, uh, city council's report. You know, like a kind of giving them a, a, I know we didn't have the capacity before, but if she's creating this and we're, we're, we're seeing it, oh. sending it to the mayor's office for the city council so they could get a COVID monthly update, you know, it helps them be more responsive to their constituents, explain why things are happening in the community that they may not otherwise um, 
be able to, to, to justify. It also it shows them how much work the health department is actually doing to protect our residents, because we're not just enforcing regulations or telling people that they have to stay home for 10 or 14 days. We are doing a lot of prevention and outreach. And by, with that knowledge, then uh, hopefully the compliance starts to, to uh, increase as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and also just to kind of avoid what we were just talking about, that sort of siloed approach <laughs> that we don't want to do. So it's best to communicate as much as we can. And especially, I think, the cluster piece, because then city council, you know, we can work with them together if we have to do something. Yeah. And the schools, yeah. too. We meet with the schools each week. And um, Megan Harvey, she's a she has her PhD in epidemiology, maybe. She does something for the schools each week um, based off of our numbers. You've probably seen them and, and it's good, but I think that added um, info from Amy is, is helpful as well. So I think that's all really good. Yeah, great idea. I'm so glad we're having this meeting. I know, isn't it crazy we used to meet each month and now it's like whenever we have, yeah. <laughs> and we can take a breath to see each other. Yeah. So. <laughs> I wish I was wherever Jennifer is because it looks way more fun than my my bedroom. <laughs> I'm at the top of Berkshire East. I <laughs> knew it looked fun. I knew it looked fun. <laughs> well, you should go go ski. Go ski. Yeah. Go enjoy the last of the sunlight. Thanks. It's, it is nice to see everyone's faces, and thank you for all the hard work everybody's been doing. Oh, you too. Hey, I feel like a total slacker. No, well, we all have our, our different skill sets. This yeah. is why they have three diverse people on this board. Yeah, and I'm sure you're slacking off at Cooley Dickinson too, so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so it's 4.53. I make a motion to adjourn this meeting. I will second. And um, motion is passed. <laughs> I'll okay. say yes. We all stay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you. Right. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.